honest questions with honest answers. This is Unfiltered, brought to you by the Emergency Medical Minute. All right, well, good morning, and welcome to a very special edition of the Emergency Medical Minute. We are very, very excited to have Patricia Hernandez and Leonette Gonzalez here with us. They are our two award winners for our inaugural Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Award. We are so excited to have them with us. They both have a wonderful story. By way of background, you know, we started this award this year. We wanted to highlight uh, underrepresented minorities in medicine, and we were fortunate to have two incredible applicants that we just couldn't couldn't say no to. They each submitted a, a really striking essay um, commenting on their background and experience in medicine. Um, I won't take up too much of the airwaves because I'd really prefer to have them talk about themselves, but wanted to highlight them today and hear their stories. And they have some great ideas for where we can go as the Emergency Medical Minute and where kind of our field of emergency medicine and, this, and just really the field of medicine in general c- can go. So we're, we're super fortunate to have you on. Thank you both for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Wonderful. So we drew random straws and we'll just have uh, Patricia Hernandez star. Could you just give us kind of a introduction to yourself and a background about what brought you to medicine in the first place? You know, tell us a little bit about growing up and how you, and how you got to where you're at and, and, and what you're doing currently. Yeah, of course. So I was originally born in sort of North New Jersey, close to New York City to a Dominican American household. So my parents came from Dominican Republic and really looking for a better future here in America. Spanish was my first language and it really kind of affected a lot of how I saw the world and sort of that culture being coming from an immigrant household um, with those values. But I did spend a lot of time in Dominican Republic and sort of seeing that juxtaposition, especially as it uh, related to medicine and seeing, you know, my grandparents move through the medical systems. So ultimately, you know, I, I always had the support of my parents and I ended ended up going to college as the first of my family to go to college. And I went to undergrad at Princeton. So I studied molecular biology and global health policy, which I felt really bridged my interest and my evolving interest in medicine, but also thinking about medicine in under-resourced and underdeveloped areas. So that was, that was great. And while at Princeton, I did a diversity pipeline program at Penn. So right across the bridge in Philadelphia, I spent two summers, my sophomore summer and junior summer of college, doing research at Penn. And that was my first sort of foot into research. And then I got paired with a mentor, which I think ultimately was one of the biggest roles in helping me to navigate medical school and being able to, you know, matriculate into medical school right after uh, graduating uh, in 2018 from undergrad. So I've been in Philadelphia for the last like three and a half years. And Philadelphia has been amazing and great in teaching me, you know, what it really means to to be a physician, to to treat a diverse patient demographic. Uh, There's a lot of poverty in Philadelphia, but there's also a lot of resilience and strength and a lot of amazing people. So I'm really excited to now be joining emergency medicine, which I think bridged all of my evolving interests. Like there's the aspect of, you know, seeing people sometimes at their most vulnerable moments, but also being able to, you know, feel like you can do something as a doctor for them that's more than just sometimes, you know, physical treatment, but really, you know, meeting them where they're at. And I think that hopefully where I, where I see my career going is sort of bridging perhaps like research and policy to try to create system level changes and, and really advocate for patients at a greater level. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. I mean, thank you. What a, there's a lot There's a lot to unpack there and, and, and a ton of great experience. What drew you to emergency medicine, if you don't mind me asking? You mentioned the ability to take care of folks that are most vulnerable. I certainly identify with that. But as you went through your rotations, you know, is it that what spoke to you the most? Yeah, I think you know, it was really me being able to connect with people. I mean, as a med student, you do have a little more time to really, you know, chat with people. And, and I was just learning so much about so many different backgrounds, like people who have very different lived experiences than my own that, you know, had so much strength in it. It was, it was encouraging. The time flew fast. It went by quickly in when I was in the ED. But I think, you know, it was some of the stories. I mean, being in Philadelphia, it's a very, there's very high um, gun violence. And there was one particular patient who came in after, you know, he was shot like 13 times uh, and he ended up being, we were running the trauma resuscitation and I I was just watching kind of on the sideline, but thinking about all the things that went into that, ultimately he ended up passing away. And later on, I found his story sort of in doing a chart review and so he had been someone who came into the emergency department multiple times in the past for, 
mental health and, you know, uh, suicidal ideation. And I just thought about like, how, how did we let him down maybe, or what, what were opportunities that we could have maybe stepped up to the plate while he was in the ED prior before being discharged to maybe avoid, you know, his ultimate death or, or the way that he ended up passing away. So there, there's just a lot to, that's going on, I feel like, in emergency medicine as a field. And I think it's amazing to see how how we all step up to the plate whenever a patient comes in. It's like, you know, you don't you don't think about like what their background is or like, you know, what they have to offer. You you try to save them and, and you try to, you know, give your best part. But at the same time, I think there's so much room for growth and I'm excited to join a field where I can hopefully contribute to that growth and sort of, uh, especially as it relates to like health equity and thinking about how we can be better on that end. Thank you. I mean, I think that that's such a wonderfully humanistic answer and uh, we're really excited to have you in the field and, and everything you said about being in the emergency department is true and it's all comers, you know, from, from all walks of life and in, in from one room to the next to the next. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about the specialty. So that's a great humanistic approach and, and really, really appreciate that. Thank you for, for your introduction and your, your story. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to now introduce Leonette, uh, Leonette Gonzalez, another award winner here. Could you similarly kind of share with us what got you into medicine and, and what has started you down this path and then kind of, kind of where you are today? Yeah, of course. So I was actually born in Cuba. My parents immigrated here on a raft in 1994. Um, I was actually the youngest on the boat. I was 18 months old. Uh, So when we got here, you know, we started from nothing. So we've had a really interesting upbringing because even though I know that we started from nothing, I don't remember ever having a household where something was missing. So I've been fortunate enough to where I've had hardworking parents that have always supported all of my endeavors, regardless of how crazy they may be. So growing up with immigrant parents, kind of like Patricia talked about, you are kind of like in the middle of these two cultural differences, right? You go home, it's super Cuban, but then you go out into the world, it's very American. So it's this clash of cultures that gives us more of an understanding towards this more uh, global perspective, right? specifically in healthcare, I actually don't come from a family that's in medicine. So how did I get started? I have no idea. I just knew this is what I wanted to do. I remember growing up, a Band-Aid made everything better. Didn't matter if you had a cut or not, it made everything better. Going to the doctor made everything better. And I was like, you know what? I want to make people feel better. Like I want to have that impact. And then of course, as I matured, I realized that medicine is fascinating. It's this great complex puzzle with so many moving pieces so it's it's almost like an adventure, like a mystery, almost like you're a detective of the human body, which to me is incredible. So I definitely knew from a small age that medicine was where I was destined to be. And in uh, addition to that, when I started going to college, I actually got uh, my x-ray tech degree. And thanks to that, that's what kind of opened the doors for EM for me. So I was working at a pediatric hospital Uh, in Tennessee. And I remember being in the ED was my first pediatric trauma case. And so of course, you see all of these people running around, everything is crazy. But then you see the ED doctor, and he's just chilling. He is the eye of the storm bringing this team together, everything looked chaotic. But everybody knew what they were doing. So it's as an outsider, it's like, yo, this is craziness. But being part of that team, it's It's a storm, but it's a storm with moving parts that everybody knows they have an end goal, which is to save the patient. So I was like, wow, look at all this. Look at this team. Look at how complex it is to an outsider. But everybody knows what's going on. Everybody's doing the same thing to reach that end goal of, you know, saving the patient regardless of anything. So that's kind of what opened the doors for EM for me. And then once I started medical school, I went overseas to Curacao, to Caribbean Medical University. And then I did most of my rotations here in Houston, Texas. And that, of course, you know, Houston has a large Hispanic population. And uh, in the ED, it's very interesting because sometimes patients would want to listen to my opinion, not the attendings, because I spoke Spanish. They felt more comfortable with me. So I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like I am here. I am this, you know, mediocre medical student. Like I'm so new. I'm very green. I don't know what's going on. And the attending who's had decades of experience and they still want to hear me just because I can speak Spanish. So it's definitely this unique perspective. Like Patricia also said, emergency medicine is 
one of the, well, the only specialty that shows you social justice, that gives you that opportunity, because we don't say no to any patients that come into the ED. It doesn't matter what insurance you have, what gender you are, what background you are, you're here in a vulnerable state, giving us your all. We just met 30 seconds ago and you're trusting us with your life. And to me, that's something very special. And in addition to that, in EM, we have a very unique perspective to create change. EM is, that's basically where we're able to see all the flaws and holes of the healthcare system. Anytime something wrong happens with our system, we're the first ones to see it. That unique perspective allows us to be the frontliners in creating change and maybe preventing an exacerbation of an event that could have been avoided. So I definitely believe EM is a very special, special specialty due to our unique perspectives and our teamwork. And we're all crazy. We all like chaos, <laughs> but organized chaos. So right. there's nothing else that I would do. Oh, that's wonderful. That is both of your answers remind me of why I do what I do. And I thank you for that. It's easy to get bogged down in day-to-day -day things. And I would encourage you both to never lose that perspective. You both have such valuable perspective on that. And while you're early in your career, you're wise beyond your years, so to speak, uh, you know, you're, you've already accumulated a lifetime of experiences and background that are going to serve you so well in our specialty and we are very fortunate to have to have you both and i think what i'm particularly struck by among many things is both of your observation about how the emergency department is where we see failings of our healthcare system right we see folks who have fallen through the cracks we are the safety net we see failings of our public health apparatus and it's what i'm hearing both of you say is that that's really drawn you to the specialty and that really kind of energizes you both and lana i'll start with you i mean what sort of kind of inequalities and shortcomings have you run into that energize you that you feel like this is something i want to get involved in where do you see kind of the the healthcare system or emergency medicine specifically Kind of where do you see things falling short and how are you drawn to those things to, to try and make them different uh, given your special uh, background? One of the biggest things I see coming from a Hispanic population, well, a Hispanic family, my parents won't go to the doctor until they feel like they're dying. And I'm like, mom, dad, you know, you need to have checkups, you need to go to the doctor at least yearly. You never know if something could go wrong. But they're the ones that wait last minute, which means oftentimes they could end up in the ED. So that, I don't know if that's something cultural, but it is something that I continuously experience in my family. So with that, in emergency medicine, these kinds of people who maybe lack the education or maybe don't realize the importance of going to the doctor regularly, they keep coming back to us. And having these same people coming back, back to us, back to us, back to us, it's just increasing costs for them, increasing costs for the hospital, increasing costs of health care solely because something is not right. Some, there's some sort of barrier that's not allowing them to get this under control. And in, as somebody who works you know, in an ED, that gives us this perspective to, okay, something's wrong here. We need to do something. And we're the only ones that see that. Same thing with the PCP shortage that's happening right now and that's going to happen. What's that gonna, how's that going to affect the ED? That means these patients, whenever we discharge them, tell them to follow up with your PCP in five days, a week or whatever. They call their PCP. I'm sorry, I don't have anything for another three months. They're going to end up back in the ED. So something needs to be done to, you know, kind of bridge these gaps that we're seeing. And again, I feel like these gaps, we see them in the ED because the PCPs don't know. You know, they might know because we call them, but just because we call them and they know they need to see the patient doesn't mean they have the space to be able to see them. So there's a lot of, I think, different tactics that need to be done to kind of help bridge different specialties to help with, you know, the management of patient care. Like ED is just one part of it, but I think we're an integral part of it. All the patients we see are patients who are in a very vulnerable state that they're trusting us. Help me, I'm desperate. And I think definitely talking to other specialties and trying to figure out how we can bridge this to help is something that really draws me. 
Yeah, I think you're hitting it right on the head about access to care in, you know, in underrepresented populations and underserved populations. Uh, and that's, and as you mentioned, that's not a problem that's improving overall. I think, you know, study after study has shown how the barriers to access to care and then chronic disease management is, is a big part of it, right? I mean, so much of what we see in the ER are exacerbations of chronic disease. And we know how much of a cost that is to the individual for their personal health, but also on a population scale. And as our population ages, and I think that we're seeing that demographic, you know, th those population demographics occurring, chronic disease management is only going to be more and more important. And as you said, we're in a unique position because we see it. We see where the, the management of that chronic disease has failed. And I think that those are excellent. Those are excellent points. As you've started your career in emergency medicine, Patricia, how, what have you seen and where does your heart tell you that there's a shortcoming here and, and, and how you can make a difference? Well, I think we, we discussed sort of what I have seen are, are the biggest areas. Definitely on, on my end, I think there's a lot of room for education. You know, the, the amount of patients that are coming in for chronic diseases, as you, as you all mentioned, and wanting and seeking help. But I think this is an opportunity. It presents a very unique opportunity to provide education to these patients about their, you know, chronic disease and maybe the importance of taking their medications or following up with their doctors. And a lot of times, especially when it's uh, from patients from, you know, under underserved backgrounds, or at least some of my family members, there's just a lot of, like, they just don't know, you know, they don't know why they should address their high blood pressure if they don't feel it. And having seen, you know, patients come into the emergency department with like the worst case scenario after chronic hypertension, right, with uh, chronic kidney disease or aortic dissection, that's a scary sight that they just don't, don't understand, right, or even with stroke. And I think making that tangible to, to patients, you know, explaining it in a way that might let them be more motivated or at least more intrigued or just more willing to, to do it. I think it's an opportunity that we have. And I know that, you know, we might say, well, we just don't have the time. I mean, in the ED, your, your job is to like, you know, are they sick or not sick and discharge? But then that brings me to my second point. And it's like a lot of the patients we're seeing are being discharged, right? And so making sure that they have, you know, a follow-up to their discharge or making sure that they're actually plugged in. I mean, when I've been on my rotations, there were a lot of patients I had where the solution was, or at least the discharge instructions is like follow-up with your primary care, but they were people that were looking for help. I mean, specifically when it comes to substance use disorder or, you know, homelessness, they were coming and they were asking like, well, can't you do something for me? And it was really, for me, a difficult thing to kind of be like, well, what can we offer them? And, you know, the response being, there's not much we can do for them here. And I do think that there is a transition happening, especially as we start to sort of think holistically about what our role can be as emergency medicine physicians in terms of really, you know, serving that need. And I think we are sort of shifting the way we think about what we do and don't do as emergency medicine doctors. And, I, and I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, with the support of hospitals and, um, you know, other people that are higher up that they can see the value in, in, you know, maybe creating some sort of streamlined process or navigation process for patients that are going to be discharged because ultimately they're the ones that come back. Right. And so I think uh, as Leanna mentioned, like the cost is actually not in our favor. If we, you know, don't really address the root cause, it's like putting a bandaid over something and not really addressing uh, where the root is coming from. So I think being able to think more more critically about what we're doing with patients who are being discharged and they don't have a primary care doctor, how to sort of navigate that and, and making that something that's done across the country and not just in one or two hospitals that have that. But but I know that's a lot more complicated in practice, right? And, but, but I'm excited to try to figure out these solutions. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, uh, I'm sure you won't let the fact that it's complicated stand in your way. I mean, I think that even moving the needle a little bit here is, you know, the beauty of the scale of, emer of emergency medicine is that with hundreds of millions of, it's usually at least over 100 million ER visits a year. I mean, even moving the needle a little bit, uh, you're talking about helping thousands, maybe you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of folks in a given year. So don't let that discourage you. I think the complexity of the system can be a lot to deal with. I mean, none of us have it all figured out. It involves, you know, it's a touch point with, you know, policy and politics. It's a touch point with social justice. It's a touch point with the healthcare system and then inpatient and outpatient. And, and there's a lot of layers, but, you know, I encourage you both to find the 
the niche specifically within that you feel passionate and emboldened and then just to chase it because you can make a difference truthfully and, and we we need it you know n- none of us are happy with the status quo but you're the type of folks who can who can who can make that change uh, and uh, I, i'm excited to see what what you both do i think Leonard, i wanted to ask you specifically about your role um as an emra uh, ambassador could you tell us a little bit more about what you've been doing with that and and uh kind of what you've learned from that and and the potential that you see in that role Yeah, so I was actually selected to be the assistant vice chair of the Emra Wellness Committee. This was last year. And it's it's a very amazing community. This community is full of all these people that are focusing on the well-being of resident wellness. And with the pandemic, we all know that now more than ever, people are talking about well-being and mental health and having a positive environment. So we really work on that. We want to bring more advocacy and let people not be afraid to speak about their experiences about you know going through bad times or going through good times so this past year we've actually worked with various committees just to kind of strengthen that wellness and during ASIP's conference last year we actually worked with a couple of committees just to kind of help to bring more awareness for well-being i personally worked with the pediatric EM community to bring uh, awareness to child trauma and child life skills that we can have as physicians so that kind of brings in a different perspective of wellness uh, in addition to that we're just very big into diversity as well I've actually just been selected for this upcoming biennium to be the chair elect. So we really have some special things planned. Our biggest thing is just advocating and just creating the space of well-being. You know, as EM physicians, we're oftentimes in chaotic situations and we want to show that it's okay to take a breath. It's okay to step back. It's okay to take days off if you need it to because it's important. It's part of your own health. It affects your patients, it affects your community, it affects your environment. So being able to talk about these things, being able to say, "You know what? I can't do this today," or "You know what? I need help" is okay. So I'm it's it's been incredible being a part of Emra. Emra has been phenomenal throughout my uh you know, my journey as a medical student and now incoming resident, it's it's a really special community. And specifically in the EMRA Wellness Committee, we are a very diverse group of people, very supportive. Everybody's just so nice and welcoming. And I think that really speaks greatly on what kind of environment we're building for EM, not just for residents and students, but also for hopefully physicians. So that's really our end goal is just to create a very good, healthy environment where people feel safe and they can talk. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You picked up a heck of a time to 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 join the wellness space, uh, you know, as the uh, as the pandemic hit and persisted over the last two years. So I commend you for that and congratulations on uh, on your next role. That's exciting. Uh, a, lot, a lot to give as you transition from medical student to resident. I look forward to seeing all the all the great work that you do to to help folks to, um, as you said, say that it's okay that when they're not okay, uh, and to think that they have a career and and a long, you know, to think longitudinally about sustainability in their careers on behalf of themselves, on behalf of their families and patients. And I, I really applaud that that perspective, and I'm I'm very thankful for it. So, you know, Patricia, I'll, I'll kick it over to you next. I, you mentioned early on about some of the research that you had been doing, and I would just ask if could you tell me a little bit more about that, about some of the research that you've done, and you mentioned that you kind of saw your career being a combined approach of your clinical practice and some some of the research that you've enjoyed doing. Tell, tell us more about that and and what that's going to look like. Yeah. So. I've had a lot of different research projects throughout medical school and, and you know, because I ended up in emergency medicine kind of late on. So I've had, you know, research even in cardiology and pediatrics and more recently now in the emergency department. But I think the overall theme for all of my projects or what I'm interested in is is centered around like health equity and sort of, you know, trying to look at the data and see where the gaps in care are and then, you know, then try to implement solutions and, and whether that's in the form of like quality improvement projects or policies uh, that can be either hospital wide and, or even like nationwide. Like I think where I envision my sort of research going or where I hope that I can really play a role in is, is in continuing that work. And so like right now, the, what I'm looking at is actually hypertension in the ED, which I know to a lot of people, like, they're like, we, we just don't 
you know, that's not something we, we treat here. And I know the like ASAP guidelines don't tell you, they say to use your judgment and it's not something that's recommended, but you know, because I am passionate about this, I see it as an opportunity. And so right now I'm looking at the data set and I'm trying to find out like, who are the people that are presenting to the emergency department with like hypertensive vitals and are not on appropriate medication. And, you know, you can find that there's actually, there, there are people that come in multiple times, with like similarly, you know, hypertensive vitals. And so, you know, one of the drawbacks people would say is like, well, that's not actually indicative of their true vitals. They're, they might not be hypertensive, but, but in fact they are, and there's research that has shown that, you know, if they come in at least one time, there's like a 60% likelihood that they will be hypertensive actually in a follow-up visit. So anyways, I say that because now I'm like really interested in sort of looking at that data, trying to better characterize who these people are and, and maybe how we can try to create some sort of like intervention to try to address this problem because it is a big problem and we know that it has long-term consequences. And that's the part that I'm more excited about because I think it, you know, involves being creative and sort of thinking about potential interventions. I think the biggest area is probably in the realm of uh, education and with technology, I think that's something that's very possible, you know, things as, as simple as like a QR code or like a video that they can watch while they're in the ED just to sort of address this. So uh, that's sort of the like my most current projects, but I've, I've had a lot of other things that have looked on on these issues of health equity and sort of been uh, trying to address it with some sort of solution. No, that's wonderful. I, I think, you know, could you, could you explain, I think it's such an important perspective and, and this, this came up as part of your, your essay too, is that there is, I'm thankful now that we're, we're finally starting to get a really robust body of literature that, ex, that really digs into some of these issues that you're mentioning, Patricia, about health equity and how, just frankly, how different of an experience folks of color have when they come into the emergency department. And I would suggest that that's probably true across all specialties, but for all the reasons that we've already talked about, you know, we come face to face with folks in their greatest moments of need, and we try and connect with them and identify with them quickly, earn their trust, and then function in their absolutely in their best interest. And yet, I think it's safe to say that it's not the same experience for people of color, right? It's been alluded to in several of your answers about language. There's a disconnect there. You know, Lynette, you mentioned folks reach out to you. They, they want to be heard and they feel like they're best heard in their primary language. And certainly we can understand that. So there's language components, there's social components, there's biases, right? And I think that's a reality of our practice. And we are all in this to take the best possible care of patients that we can. And if there's something that's holding us back from taking care of a specific population, we should attack that and we should try and fix that. And that's part of what makes us who we are in the emergency department. And Patricia, what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of your work and a lot of your passion is digging into these issues and figuring out where things aren't fair and where they aren't equal. And, you know, I just wanted to pitch it to either of you and either of you can answer first, but, you know, does that type of approach, does that resonate with you? Are there specific examples or anecdotes that you can think about that where you can see where an individual's experience in the emergency department is not what we would hope that it would be as a result of health inequalities or as a result of the way that they look or the language that they speak. Do you, do either of you have an, uh, an, an experience or maybe an anecdote or, 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 or an interaction in the ER that you can think of that kind of highlights that? And then if you're willing to share it, I'd, I'd be super interested to hear. My example is not so much in the ED. I mean, there's one that's very, I mean, we, first saw her in the ED because I was on my medicine service. But I think it speaks to a lot of the similar similar uh, kind of barriers we run into with language. And this patient in particular, she was Puerto Rican and only spoke Spanish. And she was coming in with like refractory ascites uh, because of like uh, fatty liver disease. And she's someone who would come in repeatedly to the emergency department to get uh, a paracentesis. And, you know, when, when she came in this on this visit, the, the liver team doctors, they're like, she comes here all the time. We know that she's not being compliant with her outpatient paracentesis, and, and they decided to take her off the transplant list. And I thought, you know, as a medical student, I initially kind of went with the grain, but then I was like, wait a minute, like there has to be more, you know, going on here. And so I took the time to, to speak to her. And because I spoke Spanish, you know, I didn't need a translator, but I was able to just you know, sit down with her and be like, what is your understanding of what it means to be on the, on the liver transplant list? And like, you know, um, are you taking your medications? Like, are there reasons that you wouldn't be? And I ended up sort of 
understanding a lot more to the picture. Like she was mentioning how her daughter is the only one who's, a, who's really able to take her to doctor's appointments, but uh, her daughter works a full-time job. You know, the doctors where she's supposed to go to are also really far from where she lives. In addition to that, she said, you know, they don't speak Spanish and it's really hard to really understand it, but I 100% be willing to do whatever it takes to get this transplant. And so, I mean, there was just a lot there and it took just, you know, taking a pause and really trying to communicate with her and connect with her in her language to understand this. And ultimately she was put back on the transplant list and transferred to a local hospital by her. Uh, but I think this is an example of how powerful it could be to really take that time, connect with these patients in their language. And, and it is a big barrier, especially in the emergency department when you, know, you have so many patients and you know there's not time to, to bring out the Marty and, and, and translate, or at least you think there there's not time, but sometimes that can actually be what changes sort of your decision point. So I think it's important to, to think about that moving forward. And that's just one personal example of, uh, and now when I come across patients that don't, you know, that speak other languages, um, I, I make sure to get that translator out and really try to ask them the questions that are, are important and, and, and really listen, even if it takes, you know, twice the amount of time, I think it's, it's valuable. That's a great story. Thank you, Patricia, for sharing. I appreciate it. So in a more general sense, I can't really think of a specific story right now, but I know I came across this multiple times in the ED where, like Patricia was talking about, taking the time to talk to them. I feel like a lot of these issues oftentimes are just lack of communication. They just don't know. Nobody has been able to sit down and say, hey, this is why you need to take your insulin every day. This is why you should take your blood pressure medication every day. And then you'll have the patients that say, yeah, but I feel fine. Okay, well then let's let's educate you and let's tell you why it's not fine. And even though you feel fine, doesn't mean you don't need to take it. So I do feel like our unique perspective in the ED can definitely, again, bridge these gaps in terms of communication, in terms of education, in terms of helping these patients understand. Oftentimes they come here and people from, you know, that are minorities don't even understand the healthcare system. So they come to the ED and then they get, you know, multiple bills of thousands of dollars. And they're like, I'm sorry, I just went to the doctor. No, you went to the ED, which is completely different. So again, education is of such vital importance. So I really agree with Patricia. We should definitely take the time, even if it's 30 seconds, even if it's a minute, to just make them feel comfortable enough to be educated and to ask questions as well. I've also been in different situations where I feel like patients want to ask me something, but they're embarrassed for whatever reason. So I feel like creating this safe space of, hey, it's, it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to not know and it's okay to ask. And going with that, I, it was just a recurring theme that I would keep seeing. Do you have any questions? No. But oftentimes they get asked, do you have any questions in a rushed way that they feel like, oh, he doesn't have the time to listen to me. She doesn't have the time to listen to me. So I'm not going to, you know, ask any questions. And it's, it's, it's a little distressing because I just want to say, hey, you know, do you have any questions? Like, you know, the way you say it, just to create this safe space, just to create this understanding, because even if you educate somebody and they're not willing to listen, you're wasting your time. So being able to make them feel safe and uh, create this, this space, this inclusive, diverse space of understanding is important. So, and that's something that I kept seeing throughout my rotations. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great observation. You know, I think what you're saying and what they're hearing are oftentimes two very, very different things. And as you said, I think sometimes the tone inflection of your voice, uh, when you say, do you have any questions? It really sounds like you don't have any questions, right? Yep. You know, and I think there's a lot of reasons. There's a built environment for why people feel that way or speak that way. And, and I think we need to understand, understand that. But I think you, to your point, Lynette, about creating the type of accepting and inclusive environment, you know, uh, it's built on that trust. And you mentioned that in the ER, it's our, it's our job. And frankly, what I think is really exciting and enjoyable about the job is, is to gain someone's trust within that first 30 seconds of interaction, you know, understanding that they come, when they come into the ER, they, sure, they come with the chief complaint and they come with the set of vital signs uh, and they come with a past medical history, but they come with an entire lifetime of experience. 
Uh, and, and that comes, you know, with a number, you know, that comes with societal implications. It comes with social, racial, you know, previous traumas that they've experienced at, inside and outside of the healthcare system. And they bring all of that with them. And it's, you know, it's probably not possible to fully understand everything about them, you know, as a person. But the closer we can get to that, the better that we're going to be and the better that we're going to take care of them. And I would, I think it's safe to say that the more that you are able to connect with them, you know, from, from a language perspective, if you, frankly, if you look like them, if you look and sound like them and they identify with you, they are more likely to trust you and they're more likely to open up to you, to connect with you, to share with you some of those barriers to care that you guys have mentioned. And I think that's so important. It's so important that our workforce reflects the type of patients that we're serving. And that's such an important part of the future of emergency medicine. And, and you both are such an important part of that. And I want to dive in, if you would allow me, what are some of the barriers to why our workforce doesn't look more like the patients that we serve. I think you both alluded to this in, in your essay answers is that, you know, I think we can all agree that this is really important, that patients have uh, providers, uh, physicians and APPs and nurses and all members of their care team that can, that are able to connect with them, you know, from a language perspective, maybe they look similarly, have a similar background, but we, I think we can all agree that that's important, but we're not there yet and we want to get there. And what are some of the barriers that are keeping us from getting there? I'd appreciate your guys' kind of thoughts or perspective on that. I think part of the issue could be lack of realizing how important diversity is. And it's something that we should start in education, in medical school. Medical school is difficult to get into, yeah. But right now, like the percentage of medical students who are Hispanic hasn't really changed in the past 20, you know, 20 years. And that's something that we need to work on from the root of the problem, because obviously, how are we going to have Hispanic physicians if we don't have Hispanic students? So really, we need to kind of look at how the application process is going for medical schools, what's keeping Hispanics from applying? Could it be finance? Could it be they just don't know? Could it be the fear of, oh my gosh, I'm going to get into hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and I don't want to do that? What what's going on that's keeping them from getting into medical school. And then looking at it from a physician standpoint, understanding backgrounds allows you to have a better understanding of the social determinants of health, right? And if you have healthcare providers who don't really understand this, who don't realize the importance of having a diverse workforce and how that can impact not just your patients, not just each other, but society as a whole, that's that's important. In addition to that, I think fear is also part of it. Speaking from a women's perspective, because we're also a minority, it's almost like we're afraid to apply to something out of fear of being told no. I guess that can also correlate with anybody, but I don't know. I think I read a research paper once that said that men were more likely to be able to be told no, like they were more willing to hear that. But for women, it's not something that we're used to. And plus being in a male dominant field, that gives us an even, even more of a fear. Uh, so that could also be a reason why. Uh, it is a little infuriating to see different organizations, different programs, different schools talk about how important diversification efforts are, but then you look at their leadership, everybody looks the same. So, okay, we all want to be diverse, but what are you guys doing to diversify. So um, I definitely feel there's a multitude of issues, a multitude of barriers, and I do believe that it is rooted in understanding. By understanding why it's important to have diverse leaders, I think people would be much more willing to look at things a little differently. Thank you. Really appreciate that perspective, really. Yeah, I don't know if I have too much more to add, but I will say I think cost is definitely a big reason. I think for a lot of marginalized populations, you know, it just happens to be like they are also maybe oftentimes from a disadvantaged background economically. And so you think about all the cost that goes into medical school, taking the MCAT, preparing for the MCAT. And then once you're in medical school, right, there's all the different step exams and the board exams and paying for the for the tools to prepare for those exams. So cost is a huge you know, deterrent in that, in that end. I think it's also likely that, you know, there's not a lot of physicians or healthcare providers in their families. And that, and that for me has also been 
challenging. I'm lucky that I have mentors that have been able to help me navigate that world, but I think that's something that a lot of students who are underrepresented maybe don't have, like they don't have parents or uncles or aunts who can sort of guide them through, you know, thinking about the medical field and, and their career trajectory. So I think that's a big uh, problem right now. And I think also when it gets to the residency level, I know there's a lot of programs that are doing a lot on trying to recruit a diverse class of residents, but then you look at the faculty and sort of the leadership roles and that's not reflective of that. Um, and so it's difficult to want to go to a place where you feel like you're not going to, you know, even see yourself in the leadership of that. And if you if you do hope to ultimately, you know, become a leader, which I think we all want to at, at some point, then you want to, to see that it's possible and you want to see that support. And so I think it's it's about increasing the pipeline at all, you know, at all points, all the way from when you're, you know, not even in medical school and starting to really put that uh, as an option, like have these students think like, hey, I could do this and then try to help with the navigating the process along the way with mentors, whether that's through, you know, classes or uh, networking opportunities or, you know, opportunities to do research and really get involved. And then also like at, you know, at the attending and, and you know, higher level to have that be a reflection of, of who they can be. And I think this is all going to help to produce a more inclusive environment. It's not just like diversity, but it's also being inclusive and, and feeling like you can thrive in, in an environment. And that's harder to, to do. I think right now it's harder to achieve. Thank you. I mean, both of you have clearly thought about this, you know, and amidst of what is already a very busy schedule. I mean, you have a lot of clinical responsibilities. You're trying to learn the clinical medicine. You're trying to learn the science, the physiology, you know, and kudos to you both for taking the time to think about it, you know, for investing your personal time uh, and commitment to it. And frankly, and, and taking advantage of the perspective that you have. I mean, you're both trailblazers within your own families, right? You're both doing things that have never been done in your families before. And, you know, to your points, both of you, what I'm hearing you say is that you guys in many ways are, are, are going into spaces where you're not seeing a lot of folks that look or sound or have the same background that you've had. And that takes a lot of courage to go into that space. And I think that you know, having you in that space gives the folks behind you, the, the next generation, you know, they can do it and they can believe that it's possible, you know, uh, to, to take your words directly, Patricia. And I appreciate that. And I really hope that you both know that and know you know the power of that as you go through in your careers and that what a difference that makes for the, the folks who are looking up to you. And as you've mentioned, there's different bottlenecks along the way. It's, you know, you could imagine high school students looking to go into pre-med fields in college. It's college pre-meds who don't see a lot of other folks that look or sound like them in their pre-med classes, but still believing that, you know, I belong here and I, and I, and I can thrive here and I can go to medical school because I see folks who've done it. And, and I just think, you know, uh, you mentioned that pipeline and there's, there's bottlenecks at every pipeline, every step of that pipeline, I should say. And I appreciate, you know, you, you both being aware of this and investing in this and, and educating me, frankly, on this and educating people that look like me on this. And, uh, and, and I think that we're, we are so much better off for it from generations to come. I'm really thankful for that. And I appreciate you taking, taking the time to answer. It's not an easy question and it's, Unfortunately, not an easy solution either, but one that, again, if we can move the needle, we're talking thousands of, you know, of physicians of color, of, of th you know, potentially thousands of physicians from underrepresented parts of our, of our society as Americans. And, and I think that that's such a good thing. So uh, before I have some other questions, but before I do, I want to open it up to you guys, because what's important to you is important to me. We're really fortunate to have you on. We're, we're so proud to be associated with you and to have connected with you in this way. We're really grateful that you that you applied. We're so happy. I mean, selfishly, we're happy that the EMM is now tied to these two superstars. You know, I think that uh, selfishly, we're, we're, we're really fortunate. But I want to open it up to you. I mean, I think we're really thankful that you that you listened to EMM, that you've connected with EMM in this way. And then we really want to kind of open it up to hear how we can do things better. You know, we're, we only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. And we'd love to hear kind of your thoughts about, it can be EMM centric or it can be another topic, but, but open floor, uh, open mic to discuss kind of, you know, either the emergency medical minute or, or EM in general and, and, and anything that we haven't covered thus far that, that you, either of you feel passionate about. Well, first of all, I really appreciate the fact that you guys really became trailblazers in your own way. 
since you guys provided this opportunity for us to be able to give our insight. You know, it's a little different whenever you just, oh, I have an idea, let's do this, then hey, what what can we do to make things better for you? It's a different approach. And I think I really appreciated when I saw that. And I was like, wow, these, these are some people that are really trying to get involved and trying to be better and trying to progress. And it's opening up an opportunity, not just for you guys from EMM, but also for us as medical students and upcoming residents, because it does provide this networking that is important. Communicating about diversity and inclusion is important. So you guys have this really special position where I would love to be able to see more interviews kind of like this, maybe, you know, similar to this with people who are minorities, who have gone through these difficult barriers, but have made it. If I would have been able to listen to people's stories as a pre-med or even in high school, I feel like my journey would have been much more confident in the way that I took steps in my medical, you know, my medical journey. And being able to see People make it is one thing, but being able to hear how they got there is another type of story that could be important. So I definitely love to see, you know, more, more people, more interviews, like, what's your story? Like, tell me about it. How can we fix it? How could we have made this better? Why did you have to go through these barriers, through these, you know, bottlenecks in medicine? And why is it not fixed yet? (laughs) So I think, again, Talking about this is a huge deal. The more we talk about it, the more people know about it, the more people are willing to listen. So I definitely appreciate you guys and I really do value you greatly for even providing this opportunity because that just says a lot about y'all as a company. I hear you loud and clear, Lena. Thank you. I would love to have more conversations like this. I mean, I I learned so much. I mean, this just feels like like I'm spoiled. I'm spoiled. Especially. <laughs> I mean, how often do you get this opportunity that, you know, this is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I'd be happy to have more conversations like this. Yeah. I think uh, similarly, I would love to hear about people doing their own trailblazing in the fields of people that are, you know, underrepresented, but are really successful now and are actually working to address a lot of the issues that we talked about. You know, I know that there exists some in my institution, some, you know, attendings who are working on these types of projects and interventions, but I think it would be, and I learned a lot about them actually on the interview trail. I mean, because mm-hmm. I'm passionate about this, it came up and I'm learning about what other institutions are doing. I'm like, wait, why aren't we doing that? You know, where I'm at. And so I think it's a really important platform that you all have to really bring this to the center and, and see how people are trying to think about the solutions to these problems because I think we we all know that it is a problem. We know that you know we lack in diversity and that there's inequities in healthcare. But I think trying to to think more critically about the solutions and and sort of some of the things that are going on would be really helpful. I think I also mentioned like the research just because I mean a lot of what we do in medicine is evidence based and so really looking at that research holistically and trying to you know tease it apart and see what's going on. And so, you know, I know there's a recent study that showed that a particular institution was more was using physical restraints in the ED more more commonly with uh, black and brown folks. And so, but what I think is really cool about it is that now they're trying to work on solutions and they're trying to implement, you know, educational interventions or, you know, I know about other institutions that are doing simulations to sort of address these sort of biases. So, I think having a, a space to talk about some of the things that are ongoing to try to address what we, you know, what research has highlighted is a problem. That could all be really cool. But yeah, I mean, I think this was a great, great opportunity for, for me to think about how I would want to see it. So I, I thank you guys for, for giving us that opportunity and for seeing the value and diversity in that way. Um, Cause I think it, it's definitely where we're going as a field and it's uh, encouraging to have that support. Well, I hope that you both feel supported by by us, by our entire EMM team. We frankly can't wait to see what you guys do. I mean, your your residencies are residencies are so fortunate to have you, and that the future is so so bright for you both. And and frankly, the the future of our specialty is bright because of people like you. Um, and we just want to say thank you, thank you for making the time today, thank you for applying. Uh, thank you for what you stand for and for taking the time to be so thoughtful and introspective about these really complex issues and painful issues. And uh, congratulations on 
everything that you've accomplished and everything that you're going to in the near and far future, we are so happy to be a very, very small part of it and, and look forward to staying in touch with you and to continuing to hear from you both how we can be better because uh, we are so really grateful for, for your ideas and your perspectives. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you a million times and congratulations. So again, this is Nick Sippis for uh, the Emergency Medical Minute with Lanette Gonzalez and Patricia Hernandez, the two winners of our Equity uh, Diversity and Inclusion Award. We are so proud and thank you. Thank you. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Health One Continental Division and Swedish Medical Center for their financial contributions to the EMM. Donations from them and listeners like you make it possible for us to fulfill our mission of producing and spreading free medical education to the masses. If you enjoy our show, please consider making a one-time or reoccurring donation to help cover our operational costs and keep the EMM awesome. Click on the link in our show notes to make a donation. Thank you for listening.